Open your Bibles to the twelfth chapter of the book of Genesis. Starting at verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarai his wife, and Lot his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. And Abram passed through the land into, unto the place of Sychem, unto the plain of Morah, and the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord, who appeared unto him. And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel, and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west, and Hai on the east. And there he builded an altar unto the Lord, and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed, going on still toward the south. May the Lord bless this reading from his word. One of the things that is extremely crucial to God's people in the last days, when we understand as we were speaking Sunday night in a fresh way pertaining to the call of God or the calls of God, it is extremely important that we realized when Abram was called that God gave him very explicit instructions. And why did God give him these instructions? They were very much defined. He told him to leave the era of the Chaldeans. And he was going to, with Abram, start a brand new nation. The reason that God was going to start a brand new nation with Abram wasn't because he favored the Jews. If you study Genesis 11, 21 to 25, and also Acts 14, 16, God said he gave up on all the nations because of the evil that they did and they wouldn't agree with him now, this is the reason why God chose Abram he gave up at that point of time in history and all the other nations in Genesis Adam was a new beginning when he was created in the garden. Noah, after the flood, and his son started a new beginning. Then came the judgment at Babel, or Babel. 
the land of confusion, and after judgment, God was free to give grace. So he selected Abram out of the Gentile country of the Ur of the Chaldeans. As he chose Abram, he gave him precise instructions. Abram was called to leave the Ur of the Chaldeans, for which he did. He obeyed that part of the call. Abram was told not to take his family other than, of course, his wife. He was not to take his father. And secondly, he was not to take his kindred. That was a commandment. Why? God instituted family as divine institution number three. Why did God insist and command in the Hebrew that he was not to take his family other than his wife and his own particular family. And his wife, they had no children. He missed the entire reason, didn't he? And millions and millions of Christians have never caught up with this truth. Many marriages have never caught up with this truth in its practical application. Terah took him. If you read carefully in Genesis 11.31, and God didn't call Terah, he called Abram. In Genesis 12, 1. Well, why did Terah, his father, take Abram when Abram was the one called by God? I'll tell you why. Terah was an idolater. In Psalm 96, verse 5, the Word of God says that in the original Hebrew, that the gods of the nations were idols. Demonology associated with idolatry. And the princes of the nations were demons. And this is the reason why Daniel's prayer was hindered 21 days. Terah took Abram, and God called Abram without Terah. Sounds familiar? I guess he wanted to honor the uh, teaching of the Christian family. And they went into Haran, a name which means double-mindedness, relating to passivity through indifference, and remained there for five years. After five years, Terah died. Terah represented natural human affections which united Abram to the old creation. 
Are you listening? Abram's father, Terah, represented natural human affections without faith, which united Abram, the man of faith, to the old creation. What is it tonight that unites us in our families to the uh, old creation? What is the old creation tonight? The whole head is sick. The whole heart is faint. From the soles of the feet even unto the head, there is absolutely this evening no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither have they been mollified with ointment. The entire scope of the human soul organism is rejected by God and filled with running sores. That's what the old creation is like. What have you done recently that unites you with it? The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked, but does not know it in Jeremiah 17, 9. That's the old creation. And there is a way that seemeth right, but the end thereof is the ways of death. In Proverbs 14, 12. When Jesus Christ calls a man of faith, He dogmatically says, I don't want you to take anything with you in your soul that unites you to the old creation. No sentimentality tonight. I said no sentimentality tonight. No impurity re con confronting your faith. No pity parties tonight because of circumstances and the perfect will of God. No comparing yourself with people tonight. Those things unite you to the old creation. That part of you that is desperately wicked, humanly depraved, absolutely resisted by God, rejected by the Spirit, repudiated by the Word, and condemned by Calvary. Are you listening? But Tara died. Until Tara died, there was no manifestation of God. There was no altar. There was no fruit. There was no progress in faith. Terror with his yawning, with his spiritual yawning. Terror with his double-mindedness. Terror with his idolatry. Terror with his sentimentality and relationship. Terror with his disobedience. Took Abram. He took faith. Idolatry took faith. Instead of faith renouncing idolatry. Oh, some of you feel so bad about your idolatrous affection. Makes you want to cry, doesn't it? Five long years in Haran, disobedient, only honored God in one of the three areas. He should never have taken a lot, but he did. He took his kindred. The 
There's enough sentimentality in the Christian community tonight to send a stench up to God that makes him sick. And it's in every single ministry. Sentimentality in the name of love. Sentimentality, counterfeiting spirituality, counterfeiting compassion. People that don't have the courage to execute their convictions. They don't understand that faith means, in Romans 1, 5b, obedience to Jesus Christ's commands. And Tara died. Let me ask you this tonight. Have you died to terror? What's terror? Anything that competes with the living God. Mental, emotional, physical. But there's something else about terror. They dug a hole for him. And terror was placed in a grave and they covered him up with dirt. He was buried. And even if you walked by sight, you couldn't find him. Something else. Abram had to leave Haran immediately when Terah died behind in the grave, covered up and buried. Sanctification is a series of death and a series of burials. What it really means tonight to grow in the soil of grace and to be nourished in the doctrine of Jesus Christ it means to have a definite death and a definite burial and a definite grave for every single thing that hinders faith. Everything. Do you have any relationships tonight that mutually unite you with the old creation at all. That unite you with Adam, with his bitterness, with his resentment, with his lust, with his negativity, with his reaction, with his rationalizing, with his self-righteousness, with his religious front, with his exterior of hypocrisy, do you have any single relationship tonight that unites you with the old creation? If so, you're remaining in Haran. Double-minded. Passive. With no altar. Not growing in grace. And standing absolutely miles from the promised land. You see, if we understand correctly tonight, Romans 6.11, which is a present active imperative, we are to continually Reckon that we are dead indeed. Indeed. That means burial. That means a grave. That we are dead indeed unto any production of the old sin nature, but alive singularly unto God through Jesus Christ. And that means that every single Christian that is victorious, every single Christian that grows and goes on in faith, has scores and scores of gravesides for his past. And he cannot locate what's inside of the grave. He's buried it tonight. 
And just like the Christian has had many deaths to Adam and many deaths to Adam's production and many burials and he's dug a grave and placed it in the grave with Jesus Christ, even so tonight, as we read in the Word of God in Hebrews, the 11th chapter and the 8th verse, these words, By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive an inheritance, obeyed, went out, knowing not whether he went. Not a single thing said about his disobedience. The Holy Spirit did not bring up one single thing about Abraham's disobedience. Why? It was buried in a grave. Blotted out in Isaiah 43:25, Gone forever in the sight of God. In Abram, who disobeyed God tremendously and, and embarrassed God in one way, Abraham is considered absolutely a hero with no conversation of his failure going on in the New Testament. Instead, it said he staggered not at the promises of God, but was strong in faith through a strong through faith, and wavered not. In Romans four nineteen. Uh, is that the way you do it about things tonight? You have a burial, you dig a grave, you put whatever went on in the grave, you leave it there forever. That's the way you do it, isn't it tonight? You can't remember it. And because you left it in Haran, you're a hero of faith. Because a hero of faith just believes God. The Word of God says so beautifully that in the book of Isaiah 51, Hearken to me, ye that follow after righteousness, ye that seek the Lord. Look unto the rock whence you are hewn, into the hole and pit whence you are dug. Whence you were digged, and look unto Abraham your father, unto Sarah that bear you, for I have called you alone, and blessed him, and increased him. For the Lord will comfort Zion, and he will comfort all your waste places, and make a wilderness in Eden. And God says tonight, as you travel this journey of faith, and you come alone with me inwardly, and you do not associate yourself inwardly with anything that would cause mutual bondage to the old creation. And in 1 Corinthians 15.31b, Paul said, I die daily. It means that you definitely die, you dig a grave in faith, and you have a burial. And that's the end of that bondage to that idol, to that sin, to that God of the air. It's a very interesting thing tonight. And so the Bible clearly teaches that they went on. He took Sarah, his wife, in verse 6. He passed through the land into a place called Sychem. Sychem unto the plain of Morah. Two very beautiful words tonight. Sychem means shoulder, and it means it bears burdens, and it means special strength through grace. He passed through a place where he could bear burdens because he's had a death to terror. There's been a burial. The old man is back in the grave, buried, no longer affecting his old creation. He's free to now live in the new creation. And he goes on into a place of bearing burdens in God's strength. And then he goes to Mora, which means divine instructions by words. So here he passes through a place where he bears a burden with strength and receives divine instructions by words. That's Mora. It's a very beautiful thing, but there's a Canaanite in the land. There's an enemy in the land, but he passes through. He doesn't possess the land. He passes through. He's no longer in bondage to Adam. 
He's no longer in bondage to natural affections. He's no longer in human bondage. He's now free through death. And this servant of God who will learn many amazing lessons is now free to walk by faith without the burden of the old man and now he can bear the burdens of others with strength and receive divine instructions. And the Word of God says in verse 7, And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said unto thy seed, Will I give this land? And they built, there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. This is the first time recorded in the Word of God since Adam that the Lord ever appeared to anyone. And the Lord appeared unto him. You know why the Lord could appear? Terror is dead. You know why? He's been buried. He's in a grave. And he represents authority that followed idols. Here comes the altar. This is the first time in Abram's life that we see an altar. This precious altar that Abram had beautifully speaks of communion, of worship, of fellowship, of forgiveness, of instruction, of rest. And he built an altar acknowledging Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. And as Abram now has an altar, he's restored back to total fellowship with Christ. Another new beginning for Abram. And then he removed thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel, the house of God, and pitched his tent, having Bethel, the house of God, on the west, and Hai, the place of ruins, on the east. And there he built an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. Right between a place of ruins and the house of God, he builds an altar. And he calls upon the characteristics of God. But there was just one problem with Abram. The word of God says that he journeyed toward the south. And that was a problem. Why was that a problem? Because it was Egypt. Which stands for the world. And then when there was a famine in the land in the 10th verse. He was already facing Egypt. This is a picture tonight that when the trial of your faith and the test of my faith comes, if I watch television for hours, if I do not have any communion and worship with God, if I don't understand how to separate from that that unites me to the old creation, if I live so much of my life in the natural realm tonight, I'm not in Egypt, but I'm facing Egypt. And as I face Egypt, and then comes a test, and where did he go? Right down into Egypt. Where are you facing tonight? You may not be there. What's your mental attitude? What are you really like innately within your soul this evening? Abram was facing Egypt. He should never have been facing Egypt. Isaiah 31.1 says, Woe unto them that go down into Egypt for help. The church does it with a smile and they thank Egypt for it tonight. If I'm anywhere near Egypt, mentally, when a trial comes, I'll go there physically. And you mark it down this evening. And we have people tonight who love God, who are saved, who are not in Egypt and they're not in the world, but they're toward the world. And the moment a test of faith comes, and remember, difficulties do not come many times because of disobedience. They come for promotion to reveal Jesus Christ and the angelic conflict and the manifestation of his name to men. But even though he goes down into Egypt when he's tested in Canaan through God's famine in the land of promises. And I love this story because God was preparing Abram for more and bigger things. And he was failing just about everything he faced.
disobeyed God at the beginning, disobeyed God in Haran, disobeyed God in Canaan, disobeyed God in Egypt. Look to him, the word of God says. You know what it says? From the hole he came from, and Sarah that bare you, who never did become spiritual until she was 89. But God, in his gracious love, said, look at Abram. Look at Abraham. He didn't say, look at Abram. He said, look at Abraham in Isaiah 51, 1 and 2. And so we have this amazing picture, which is quite a story. And then I'm going to close in five minutes. God never gives up on his man or his woman. God never gives up. On his man or his woman. He had every reason in the world to give up on this man. This man lied. This man disobeyed. This man committed adultery. This man listened to his wife instead of God. This man listened to terror instead of the Holy Spirit. This man heard from God with a tremendous manifestation and built an altar and still disobeyed and headed toward Egypt after he built the altar. Then when the test came in 1 Peter 1, 7, the trial of his faith, he goes right down into Egypt. These things were written for our examples and for our prophet in 1 Corinthians 10, 11, in 2 Timothy 3, 16, and Romans 15, 4. But God didn't give up. Here's a mother who calls us up. And she said, my son is a drug addict. He's in for the 15th time. He's stolen. He's robbed. The police have had it. He's arrogant. He'll have a trial shortly. This time it could be 10 to 15 years because of his record. Everybody resents him. Everybody hates him. The police can't stand him. He's worthless. He's no good. He's a failure. And then she cries and said, but he's my son. And I won't give up. If she, being a sinner, who perhaps sometimes was sentimental, wouldn't give up on her son, here's Jesus Christ that says, I will never, no, never, no, never, No, never leave thee nor forsake thee. I will go with you even to the end of the world. My Holy Spirit will never leave you though you grieve him or quench him. Jesus Christ will not give up on any person that belongs to him. Parents, do give up sometimes, but he will not. There's a very interesting verse in Psalm 27:10. When my father and mother forsake me, I used to think that was when they had problems and the child was left innocent, but I found out tonight that's not what it meant. It means when rebellion and wickedness and deceit come into a child and the child grows up in arrogance and he cannot be controlled or tamed by any human institution and he becomes an utter outcast and his father and mother have to forsake him because of his obnoxious, ridiculous rebellion, God takes him up. Because nobody can love like God. Nobody. Isaiah, the 50th chapter in the B part of the 10th verse, says so beautifully, when a servant walks in darkness and has no light, it doesn't mean just in suffering as we sometimes use. It means also in another application, when a servant fails and walks in sin and refuses the Word of God and he has no light and he's, and he's going around wallowing in defeat and misery and guilt. Let him put his mind on God and that love will be waiting because God never gives up. I never, no, never, no, never give up. 
I received a note today from a very beautiful Christian, and it said this. Psalm 149, verse 6. Let the high praises of God be in your mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. The high praises of God in your mouth and a two-edged sword, the word of God in your hand. When thou goest, it shall lead thee, the word of God. When thou sleepest, it shall keep thee. When thou awakest, he will talk to thee. The two-edged sword, the word of God. Teach me to do thy will, O God, for thy spirit is good. Lead me into uprightness. And while the word of God says in, in Psalm 64, 5, they encourage themselves in an evil matter. They commune laying snares privily. They say, who shall see them? They are traitors and heady and high-minded. But when all of this is going on in the kingdom atmosphere, when we go to sleep, God keeps us. When we wake up, he talks to us. When we lie down, he blesses us. And men that love him and know him and understand that God never gave up with Abraham but made him the father of many nations and the father of a new nation. And God never gave up. And so what happens? We have the high praises of God in our lips. What does it mean this evening to have the high praises of God? It means beyond human words, beyond natural affection, beyond circumstantial response, beyond conditional response. It means, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, I have an altar that even Abraham didn't know anything about in Hebrews 13.10. I have a special altar, and every born-again Christian in the world has the privilege of this special altar. It's an altar that is, has no absolute conditions to God's love. Believe, and you're saved. Believe, and you have the Spirit. Believe, and you begin to receive the Word of God. This altar was never understood in the Old Testament. It's an altar of cleansing, an altar of purging, an altar of blessing, an altar where in Hebrews 11.8, not one single criticism is mentioned about Abraham. Oh, they said he was called, he went and he obeyed, but it never says he disobeyed. That's the God that blots out sin. That's the God of Hebrews. That's the God of the new altar. The altar where Jesus Christ sees us in union with Him, and the Father sees us hid with Christ in God, and He uses the two-edged sword to get us back into the new creation. We don't have time tonight to play games with God like God is the creature and we're the Creator. We don't have time tonight to begin to live in the valley of despair or in the mountain of pride or the hill of arrogance. We don't have time tonight to walk in indifference and passivity. Jesus Christ, our living God, has commissioned us and commanded us to love each other, to go in all the world. He's given us His high praises in our heart and a two-edged sword in our mouth. He has told us, clearly tonight that no matter whatever happens he's there and he will never give up on the lowest person in all the world because his love cannot give up he has paid for their sins he's redeemed them he'll restore them he will build them up he will bring them back because he's in the business of repairing and restoring through revealing his love and jesus christ this very moment is speaking to someone and maybe to many and he's saying you're discouraged and you're condemned and you don't like yourself and you don't love yourself. I want to say in the authority of the word of God tonight, he will not give up. He will not give up on his people. He will not give up on his purpose for them to conform them to his image. God will not give up on your marriage. It may be months and years uh, of halfwayness and harren. Maybe certain things you haven't pronounced dead yet. You need to die. You need to dig a hole. You need to have a graveside ceremony tonight. And you need to get together with your family, with your husband, with your own heart tonight and have some burials. And mark it down. I've had this graveside ceremony. I've had this graveside ceremony. And I'm free to enjoy the love of God and to go forward into Canaan and pass through 
Shechem or Sychem and pass through Morah and begin to have strength to bear burdens and instructions from God through grace in the land of promises. Would you bow your heads, please, and close your eyes? With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here tonight and you've never received Christ as your Savior, and you'd like to tonight, say, Father, forgive me, cleanse me. Lord Jesus Christ, come into my heart to live. I want to be blood-bought tonight. I want to be born again of the Word, born again of the Spirit. I receive Christ as my personal Savior. Raise your hand and put it up high. Nobody's looking. Every single head is bowed. Say, Father, forgive me. Lord Jesus, come into my heart to live. Raise your hand. Put it way up high. Way up high. That hand there, okay. Thank you. To the right. God bless you. Keep it up. Keep it up, sir. And the ushers are going to take you out just for a moment to instruct you on what you've done. So keep your hand up and go right out with an usher as you've responded to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Is there another tonight? There's another one to the left. Father, forgive me. Cleanse me. Lord Jesus, come into my heart and save me and cleanse me. Put your hand up high. Way up high. Way up tonight. Way, way up. Precious Father, tonight we love you and thank you. We, We belong to you. And, oh, God, I say it to myself and to everyone here. May we be very serious about not only dying to what sin produces and what sin is, but also having a grave dug and having a burial service and then going to leave it behind. Father, grant it tonight and reality and earnestness and so we pray that you bless our dear folks tonight bless them as they go home and travel bless those that are in the rap session and of course bless karen and glenn tonight those dear folks that we love so deeply and anyone else in need in this body through jesus christ our precious lord amen you're dismissed